Isn't it amazing? I mean, to be here, as you, I think you were just saying, it's a once in a lifetime experience. Um, it is, it's uh, so far away from us. You know, it took me uh, uh, 10 hours to Europe. I spent you know, a week in Europe and now it's uh, almost another 70 hour uh, to this place. But I think considering, I guess, you know, passion, clearly we both share in the climate space. And I mean, we're both in the climate finance space. I mean, to come here and see firsthand, I think what, what is actually happening. I mean, I certainly find it motivational. Um, now my first impression is so clean here, you know, air is clean, water is clean, you know, food is safe. It's, it's, the it's, it's amazing, you know, this is what the uh, developing countries are dreaming for for many decades. And uh, we need to protect this place. But on top of that, what we cannot see is the impact of global warming, as we saw from the uh, professor yesterday. You know, he shows all these uh, impact of uh, you know, fossil fuel burning on yeah. um, climate and uh, temperature maybe rising three, four degrees a century, which means that uh, you know, ice melt and the uh, sea level is going to increase oh, exactly. quite I dramatically. And uh, you know, a lot of coastal areas uh, you know, will be uh, underwater. So that was Dr. Michael Mann, and I, mean, I, th I found what was it, what I found really interesting from that presentation was how warming here is affecting what we're seeing, you know, the extreme weather events we've seen this year in 2018, um, you know, the hurricanes, the heat waves. But you know, so, I mean, turning to you, you're, you're I mean, I think what's fascinating is you're, you've become a bit of a hero to us, um, previous chief economist at the uh, Chinese Central Bank. Um, and now I believe you're, you're with a think tank at Tsinghua University. That's you right. wear multiple hats. So you're chairing um, the, the China Green Finance Committee, is that That's right? That's right. Um, why, why has this become so important in China? Because I think still, you know, many outside of China, um, I was going to say the West, but I think outside of China, still have this perception that China is behind in these things. But I mean, the reality is China has become a real leader, particularly in the area of, of climate finance. I mean, why is that? Well, what's driving that, do you think? Well, what really happened is the uh, last few years, China began to uh, launch its green finance initiative. I think for people who are not watching the space for the last three, four years, they probably had the impression that China is behind. But in fact, relative to many other countries, you can see the China introduction of green finance policy was uh, leading. Um, we introduced the Green Finance Guideline 2016, which is the first set of comprehensive policy guidelines on green finance. And it was later followed by many other countries, uh, including you know EU's introduction of uh, action plan on sustainable finance, and uh, we introduced a mandatory requirement for climate and environmental information disclosure for listed companies uh, to be implemented in three phases, uh, from 2017 to 2020. So by 2020, China will be the, I think, uh, uh, the only large economy that has introduced a mandatory requirement for environmental information disclosure. Plus, uh, we launched a green bond market in 2016. It's later than Europe, but uh, it became number one in terms of size in that year. That was fascinating mm -hmm. yesterday. I mean, the, the comment that, that China is now the, the green bonds leader. And I, I'm struck by the comment. I mean, I've just come here um, almost, almost from the GCAS, the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. Uh, and the contrast, I think, with China, where you know your central government, your president, um, is very bought in to this agenda and this sort of green transformation. Whereas in the United States now, um, they're having to do this bottom up despite, mm -hmm. despite the, um, the federal government. Right, uh, I think leadership and support is so important. Uh, in China, at the time we proposed the idea uh, to the central government, uh, it was immediately endorsed uh, on establishing the green financial system. Then our president, our premier, our central bank governor and all the deputy governors were talking about green finance, its importance and its actions. So it mobilized a lot of support from the entire economy, including you know, all the major banks, uh, uh, institutional investors, they were mobilized and they created sort of internal plan for green finance initiative. And also we promote this to the global stage, including uh, China initiating the G20 yep. Green Finance Study Group, which uh, you know, Michael Sharon and I were chairing over the past three years. So Michael Sharon from the Bank of England. From Bank of England. Yes. And that, I think, uh, indeed, mainstreamed the idea of green finance uh, among policymakers globally. 
And you're, you're also very involved in, in the sort of G20 as well on this whole Yeah, space. G20, uh, it's a study group which used to be called G20 Green Finance Study Group launched in 2016 and now it's been the third year. And as a spillover of this G20 work on green finance, um, you know, French, uh, Chinese, UK, Germany and other central banks launched a um, central banks and supervisors network on green mm. financial system which I think is another great initiative. Uh, this uh, network will be looking at uh, you know, various options on how regulators can push for green finance. And uh, uh, one of the work stream, which is called supervision work stream, that I chair under the network, will be looking into whether we should be reducing risk of weights on green assets so this is the for sort of the role banking of sector. The role of central banks as, as it's, their supervisors. Uh, either of central banks or the you know, banking supervisors, they should be thinking about that. My personal view is that we should go for that. Uh, in fact, China may have uh, the, uh, the best condition for introducing you know, this uh, uh, measure earlier because we have definition of green loans mm -hmm. for the last five years. We have collected the uh, green loan information in terms of outstanding amount and also default rates. We have shown that the green loan default rates are much lower than non-green loan default rates. So based so on so it's just safer. Yeah, stability perspective, you know, it justifies uh, reduction of risk of weights for green. So clearly, I mean, there's a number of drivers for China to be doing this. Um, you know, environmental um, conditions um, are an important driver. I mean, clearly the awareness of, of climate change. Um, but also, how important is the economic opportunity here in terms of transforming? I mean, I mean we have China to thank, I think, in many ways for scaling up the production and bringing down the cost of much of the clean technology, mm -hmm. wind and, and solar, um, obviously the German taxpayer for the, for the initial sort of support, but China's really scaled up manufacturing um, and helped bring those costs down dramatically. So is it really seen as a, as a major economic opportunity? It's clear to us that uh, you know, green finance, um, by promoting green economy, it can enhance economic growth rather than reduce economic growth and uh, 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 destroying jobs. In fact, in areas such as solar, wind, uh, you know, water treatment, mm -hmm. uh, subway, railway, and all that, the green finance supported projects can grow much faster uh, than the rest of the economy. So it's growth enhancing. And second thing is really about technology development. Many of these new green areas require technology, and innovation requires finance. So uh, finance in the green sector again, is a major impetus uh, for technology innovation. Well, fascinating. Um, and just, I mean, I've, do, where, where do you think, I mean, there still seems to be a resistance in many of the incumbent companies. I mean, despite all the evidence, despite even many of the, the companies themselves acknowledging the risks of climate change, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the big fossil fuel, oil and gas companies. Do you think those companies will be able to make this transition? Um, I think a couple of things need to be done. One is certainly at the government level, uh, there need to be a signal um, you know, for the government interested in addressing this issue, then many of the corporates will respond. The second thing is about disclosure. Uh, we need to improve disclosure of climate environmental information by all major corporates. And uh, once this is done, I think it becomes a sort of a name and shame mechanism for those who are not performing. Do, do you think, I mean, I'll be talking about this later, I mean, we're both talking at this, this event, but I mean, I'll be talking about the sort of disclosure we need that needs to be decision useful disclosure, rather than just lots of disclosure, <laughs> it needs to be decision useful and, and allow investors, I think, to compare different companies. Right. I mean, do you think that's... We do look at TCFD recommendation. Uh, the task force on climate-related yeah, financial task disclosure. task force on climate-related financial disclosure. It provides a good framework. But we also feel that the... Uh, you know, just focusing on qualitative information is not enough. The market needs quantitative Quantity, information. Yeah, exactly. And that's why uh, in China we're putting together a template. And now it's in draft form, but we will uh, later push it as a formal sort of requirement for this company. Uh, that may include indicators such as uh, carbon emission, SO2, NOx, COD, um, energy consumption and water consumption. These are the few which I think are the core of um, quantitative indicators that uh, most uh, listed companies will have to disclose. And the final, sorry, I just that was the final question, but really the final question. You, just because you talked about governments need to send a signal, and of course, you know, China is developing um, a national carbon pricing scheme, carbon market. 
Um, how important is that, do you think, in, in this transition, in sending that signal? Uh, carbon market certainly is important, but uh, <clears throat> you know, it's not the only instrument. Um, mm. We can uh, mobilize the support from banks and other institutional investors uh, you know, by internally generating incentive, for example, incentivizing their green lending behavior, green bond assurance by some sort of subsidies or uh, performance measurement and so on. But if on top of that we have carbon price as incentive, I think that strengthens the, uh, the green behavior. Well, thank you, Dr. Morjan. Um, it, what an amazing place to it is. have this conversation. It's, it really makes it... looks it, great, but it's it freezing. <laughs> it, is, it is bloody cold. Yeah. Um, remember to subscribe um, to the channel um, and follow uh, these conversations with yet another climate rock star, um, Dr. Marjoram. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a very good interviewer. Thank you. Well, there can't be a more inspiring place. What, was, what I've struck by, you know, when there's no one around cars, mm. it's just how quiet.